newscast. <laughs> All right. What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Brian Miata. Today we're going to be talking about some of my favorite automotive myths. You want to read the first? Uh... Sure. Number one, high octane fuel adds performance. <laughs> well, this is kind of true, but not in the way that a lot of people think. You're not just going to take high octane fuel and put it in a car that wasn't originally tuned for high octane fuel and make power with it. It's going to make no difference. Yeah. If you have your uh, basic Toyota Camry and uh, you put 93 octane in it, uh, it's, it's not going to do anything. <laughs> Um, what high octane fuel actually is, a lot of people think high octane fuel is more volatile than low octane fuel, and that's not the case. It's actually the opposite. High octane fuel is actually less volatile because what you want in a high compression, high performance motor is you want one flame front that starts in one point at the spark plug and flows away from the spark plug in an even motion. Now, what happens if you have uh, low octane fuel in a motor that was tuned aggressively for high octane fuel is you'll get multiple flame fronts within that combustion event. You'll have an explosion here, explosion here, an explosion here, and uh, that can give you spark knock and detonation. Spark knock. Doesn't sound good. So uh, cars that actually, there are cars that come from the factory that are actually designed to run on high octane fuel and those cars have their timing pushed to the limit and they have high compression ratios and they need this less volatile fuel to avoid having uh, dangerous combustion events. But your average car that is designed for 87 octane, which is most cars, is going to run just as well on 87 octane as it will on 93. It doesn't make a difference. So that myth is... Busted! <laughs> <No. Yeah. laughs> Alright, number two? Yeah, what's number two? Cars need exhaust back pressure. Yeah, a lot of times you'll hear people say that their car's not running as strong as it should because it needs more back pressure. They'll have installed a larger exhaust system. Maybe they put a 3-inch exhaust system or a 2.5-inch exhaust system on a car that came with a 2-inch exhaust system. And they're saying, now I lost low-end torque because there's not enough back pressure. Well, it, it may be why you lost some low-end torque, but it's not back pressure that you're losing. Back pressure is always bad. Uh, what it actually is that you're losing is exhaust velocity. Mm. So, I think I'm going to break out the whiteboard for this one. All right, let's do this. All right. All right, so we have your exhaust pipe here, and you have your header or exhaust manifold with multiple pipes combining down into one, and you have exhaust pulses coming out of each header pipe out of your a cylinder head. So what happens is you get a pulse traveling down the line and you'll have a pulse after pulse after pulse and each exhaust pulse shoots down the exhaust system and creates a negative pressure wave behind it which will draw the next pulse and they call that scavenging. So that actually makes your your uh, header or exhaust manifold work more efficiently. But what can happen is if you go with a larger diameter exhaust pipe Whoop. Sorry. <laughs> so you go with a you know say this was a two inch and you went with a three inch what can happen is your exhaust pulse can go in and instead of going fast because it's in a restricted space and just shooting down what will happen is it'll just kinda like swirl around in here and you'll lose exhaust velocity so it can't draw that next pulse um, from the next uh, <laughs> header tube so so smaller is better? Well, no, I mean, <laughs> the, the other variable here is um, what you want to tune the car to do. This larger exhaust system, although it's, it could lose you some low-end torque, the extra volume you have in here is going to benefit you when you're at higher engine RPM and your engine is making enough air to fill this. Your exhaust velocity will eventually reach a point of efficiency. So it's all about where you want to make efficiency at. What RPM do you want to make efficiency? So back pressure is never good. Never good. You're not getting back pressure by having a smaller pipe. You're actually reducing back pressure with these negative pressure waves by having more exhaust velocity. Hmm. So forget about back pressure forget about and it. speak in terms of exhaust velocity. That's a new term for your uh, dictionary. 
Next. Next, number three. Fuel pumps and injectors, bigger is not always better. Yeah, a lot of people think that you can just take larger fuel injectors and put them in a car and you'll increase performance, and that's not the case because your fuel injectors are not actually robbing you of performance being mm -hmm. a stock size until you max them out. So if you're not maxing them out, then okay. adding larger injectors is not going to do anything good for you. So the, the cases where you might be maxing out your fuel injectors is are where, where you have like a major performance increase that would come with forced induction or uh, some major engine modifications like heads and cams, you might max out your injectors. But on a car that you're just doing uh, some basic bolt-on stuff, uh, it's unlikely that you're going to max out your injectors. And you can't just put different injectors in a car. Mm -hmm. You can't change the flow rate of the injectors without changing what the computer's doing. So if you just... That's going to mess I've up. I've seen people make this mistake <laughs> before. Yeah, they just put larger fuel injectors in their car and it's running very rich and making less power and actually barely running because you're, you have to have a certain air to fuel ratio. And if the computer doesn't know that you're running larger injectors and you just change the injectors... It's going to be like, WTF! <laughs> yeah, your air fuel ratio is going to be all wrong and you're going to actually make less power. So if you're going to be putting larger injectors in your car, you're going to need standalone engine management or some type of uh, piggyback engine management to trick the computer uh, into giving you the right uh, pulse duration, the injector pulse duration. Oh. Hey! Special guest. <laughs> Hi. It's okay. <laughs> All right, you ready for the next one? Next. Let's talk about the downside to big brakes. Big brakes, yeah. I mean, a lot of people put big brakes on their car, and big brakes are awesome because they can absorb more heat. You'll have less fade, and uh, it's great for, um, like, say, track days where you're going to be giving 100% braking power all the time. But for some things, like drag racing, big, ra big brakes can actually, uh, you know, slow you down. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, what you're doing... If you put huge rotors on your car, if you think about it, you're increasing your rotating mass there, and that kind of undoes everything that you're trying to do, putting on lightweight wheels. Mm. Uh, rotating mass is worth a lot more than weight anywhere else on the car. Adding yeah. unsprung rotating mass to a, a wheel is one of the biggest things you can do to rob yourself of performance and acceleration. And also, aside from the fact that you're using a lot of power to, to rotate that wheel and rotor, and accelerate it forward at the same time. It's also unsprung weight, so it affects negatively the way that your suspension controls that wheel. Um, you know, the weight of <laughs> the weight above the uh, the suspension is controlled by the suspension, but your wheel and ev and everything on that end of the suspension that's that's something heavy, yeah, that's yeah. bouncing off the road, and and uh, it'll be bouncing off the road in a less controlled manner the more it weighs. Big brakes are good for some things, mm -hmm. but there are some things to consider when you're putting a big brake kit on your car. If you already have limited power and acceleration and you don't need that extra stopping power, you might want to consider just upgrading your rotors to a higher quality casting and maybe just using a different compound like a race compound pad and uh, keeping your stock size rotors. Hmm. So right. something to think about. Definitely. All right, so let's talk about PCV system. Or that? Yes, the PCV system. This is uh, something that a lot of people tinker with or delete on their race cars and uh, or their, you know, weekend warrior cars. Weekend warrior, I like that too. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you why you probably shouldn't delete your PCV system. That's your positive crankcase ventilation system is what it stands for. I have no idea what that means. Well, what it does, <laughs> <laughs> what it does is you have basically a hose hooked to the intake manifold of your car and that hose runs to your valve cover and that draws a vacuum on basically your whole engine and uh, what one thing that that does is it takes the oil fumes and it runs them through the engine and burns them so you don't get smells and things like that <laughs> from the oil fumes that's helpful <laughs> but, yeah I mean that's uh, you know a drivability and practicality daily use kind of thing but it does something else that a lot of people overlook it actually uh, puts negative pressure on the crankcase, so you know that saves your seals. If you don't have that negative pressure in there, you could actually have positive pressure in your crankcase. And a lot of people will delete their PCV systems, and then they're like, you know, hmm, 
my uh, front main seal is leaking, or my rear main seal is leaking, hmm. <laughs> you know, and they never quite make that connection, but having negative pressure inside your crankcase is going to make all your seals not want to leak, whereas if you don't that's have that thing. system, you're going to have positive pressure in there, and that's going to make even a good seal want to leak. So if you do have oil migrating from your PCV system into your intake manifold, which is a reason why a lot of people delete them, mm. your best bet is just to add a catch can, an oil catch can. And uh, this is also a spot where people make mistakes because they'll put an inline vented catch can on the hose that runs from your intake manifold into your engine. You want that catch can to be unvented because if you put a vent on that catch can, it's not going to pull a vacuum. It's just going to pull air in through the vent and it's not going to pull a vacuum on your engine. So unvented catch can goes on the hose from your intake manifold into your engine. And if you want to put a vented catch can on the breather, the valve cover breather, that's where you put a vented catch can. So mm -hmm. make sure you use your catch cans right, because even when people try to do things right with catch cans and not deleting the PCV system, a lot of times they're using their catch cans wrong. So another thing to think about there. <laughs> Just thought, use your catch cans correctly. There's no reason not to. Exactly. <laughs> All right, so tell me about radiator size. All right, well, a lot of people upgrade the radiator size on their uh, race cars. And yeah, that's great, but a lot of times they're still having overheating problems. And a lot of times people are upgrading their radiators when the radiator was never really the problem. Well, what's the problem? A lot of times the problem is airflow, air management hmm. around the radiator. So in order for your radiator to work properly, you need to create a situation where you have high pressure in front of the radiator and low pressure behind the radiator in your engine bay. And a lot of times, you know, people change the front ends of their cars in a way that makes that not the case anymore. Hmm. They remove cowling from around the radiator, they remove their stock radiator shroud and just zip tie a fan directly to the radiator fins, and there's, you know, surface area on the radiator that doesn't have air being pulled through it. Hmm. Sometimes they'll remove um, a splash pan or a lower piece of uh, front air dam or something from their car, like uh, on my Thunderbird. There's a front air dam yep. um, directly underneath the radiator, and what that does is it creates a high pressure buildup in front of the radiator. This is common on cars that have, uh, you know, a solid grill and the air enters from underneath. It creates a high pressure zone in front of the radiator, and that causes a low pressure zone behind that air dam. So air naturally wants to travel from the high pressure zone in front of the radiator the through the radiator to the low pressure zone in the engine bay. So and that's good. Yeah, and there's a lot of things that people do that that make the uh, underhood area a high pressure zone, which it's not it makes it hard mm. for your fans to do their job, mm. and it makes it hard for even the motion of the car traveling down the, the road or track to uh, force air into that engine bay. So things to think about is mm -hmm. keeping the side cowls next to your radiator, keeping a good radiator shroud, if not the stock one, a properly designed aftermarket one, and uh, keeping your splash pan in place. Um, nine out of ten times if you're having overheating problems on a race car, it's really the, the air management system because even the stock radiator on cars is designed by the factory to do way more than it will ever have to do. These cars are torture tested in the hottest places in the world. Um, the, the radiators are always oversized. I know they look small and dinky, but they're, they're very powerful and effective at cooling your car if they get the proper airflow. All right. Number seven, mud tires versus snow tires versus all season tires versus high performance tires. Okay, okay. So <laughs> the first thing I want to talk about is uh, mud tires and snow tires. A lot of people think that these tires can both do the same job because they both have an aggressive tread lug to them. But there's actually a very different strategy between hmm. mud tires and snow tires. I've never heard of mud tires before. Yeah, mud tires that people put on trucks, you know. Oh, for like the Jeeps when they go off-roading? Yep, yep. Oh, I didn't know that. They had special tires. Cool. And you'll notice when you look at a mud tire, it has a big, you know, tread yeah. lug. And it looks very aggressive. And snow tires often look very much yeah. the same. I have snow tires, so I, I'm familiar with those. But the strategy <laughs> with a mud tire is the mud tire wants to expel the mud. Mm. That's how they make traction, because if it slicks up with mud, yeah. you're going to lose traction. The snow tire strategy is the snow tire wants to hold the snow. That's right. Because snow on snow actually makes the best traction, as opposed to mud, where mud on mud makes no traction. <laughs> 
So they use a very different strategy. So a lot of times um, snow tires will not work well in mud and mud tires will not work well in snow. Okay. All right. Uh, so on to all season versus uh, Perform high performance okay. tires. Yeah. Now, are we talking about, before we move on, I'm just curious, are we talking about just driving on the road, or are we talking about actually racing and drifting and doing all that? Like, what are we... I think we'll talk about both. Okay. Um, All-season tires versus snow tires. Mm. Let's talk about all-season tires versus snow tires. Snow tires all the way, more smoke. That's what I see. That's what I, I like as a camera person, so... I my so <laughs> all season tires a lot of times will say they're performance tires or they'll do good in the snow but they really they're really not great for anything they don't give you good performance on the track or street they don't give you grip in the snow they might be semi okay in the mud <laughs> You're like, I don't they're know. just they're not picking any one strategy and really working at it basically they're trying to do everything all at once so yeah, that's never good. they're gonna mm -hmm. slick up somewhat too much they're gonna expel too much snow mm -hmm. and they just don't have the surface area to get you around the track way way too much uh, open space what they do do well is they handle water and that's an area where a track tire that is going for maximum surface area on the road is going to cause you problems um, a high performance tire will actually give you good grip um, in on a wet road, but there's a difference between a wet road and a road that has standing water. If you hit standing mm -hmm. water with a high performance track tire, um, that water is going to come in between your tire and the road, and you are going to be hydroplaning. Mm -hmm. So not drifting. It, it's it, you can't you can't like turn it into it's, a drift. It's hard to drift when you have zero control. You need a little bit of grip to drift. So. Uh, high performance tires are going to give you a lot of grip on a clean road and and they'll even give you good grip on a wet road but not on standing water on standing water you're going to get good grip oh, with snow tires none of that not on the you're, camera this is a, this is a family show <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> in standing water pretty much every other tire is going to give you much better grip than the high performance tire your uh, your snow tires will have enough space to clear water your all-season tires are going to do great on water. Most of those are designed for that. And uh, your mud tires should have plenty of room to expel water, too. So my question is, what about summer-only tires? So I had a Ford Focus ST, and I had summer-only tires. Like, where does that fall into this? Well, those tires did have uh, some channeling to expel water. Yeah. Um, probably not the best for standing water, but also not the worst. And they were horrible uh, in the snow. <laughs> Just like the Firehawks that are on the Z right now, you've been driving mm -hmm. the Z. Which I love. <laughs> those Firehawks, um, they're a, a decent performance tire with a decent compound for track, but they're also not geared uh, with maximizing surface area. They do have some channels to expel water. So you may have noticed that when you hit puddles, you did not hydroplane. Uh, no, I was drifting. <laughs> I went sideways, so, you know. Well, that would be a power application. <laughs> Maybe uh, this season you might see me behind the wheel. We'll, we'll... Yeah, we're going to try to get her to a clinic and uh, Maybe. Maybe put her in the Z. We'll see. We'll see. No promises. But, Sinkies, what do you think? Should I, should I drift? He said meow. He didn't say anything then. But, all right. So it's settled. Well, leave a comment down below if you want to see me drift, possibly. You know, I'll take that into consideration. I am thinking about it. Alright, so next, number eight, front wheel drive cars don't need wings. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll see this all the time on uh, Facebook. Somebody will have a wing on their front wheel drive car and somebody else will post a comment saying, why does it have a wing? It's front wheel drive. Well, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you, stickers. <laughs> exactly. Just because a car is front wheel drive doesn't mean it doesn't need rear grip going around the track. If you're going fast enough to generate downforce, you're still going to benefit from having that extra rear grip when you're going around the track. It's going to increase the speed that you can be traveling at before your car loses traction. All right, so it's good. Yeah, so any car can benefit from a wing. So this myth was busted. All right, that was number eight. So number nine. Ooh, I like this one. This is one of my favorites. All right, so getting... A decent sounding exhaust. How do you feel about that? Well, it's a hard thing to do. Even if you buy a high quality exhaust like an HKS or some brand that you're, you know, is very expensive. Yeah. I mean, so, how many videos have we done for just your car alone in the exhaust? Yeah, and a lot of these <laughs> exhausts are designed with your stock catalytic converter and manifolds in mind when they sound test them. Mm -hmm. So what happens a lot of times 
is uh, you'll take a car, you'll put headers on a car, put down pipes on it, you'll have a uh, test pipe, cat delete, whatever. Um, not you, Snicky, you're okay. You're yeah, a good cat. Yeah. We like cats. You so, can. and then that totally changes the character of the exhaust, so even a good name brand exhaust could be very raspy or just excessively loud. Hmm. So, and there's a lot of uh, misinformation about how to actually get a good sounding exhaust system, but there's some really simple rules and uh, methods to doing it. And uh, the main thing, the most important thing I think that I've learned of uh, building exhausts all these years is the biggest glass packed resonator that you can fit. Um, the, the things that you don't like, the things that people call rasp and the things that make your car sound ricey like a can of bees, <laughs> um, that's all high frequency noise. And the way to get rid of high frequency noise is a big resonator. So what a lot of times what I'll do is I'll just buy the longest resonator I can fit. So like on the Z we put in a 30 inch louvered resonator and that cuts all the high frequency noise. So all you're getting is the deep sounds and the deep tones are the ones that make an exhaust system sound good. Your you car can take good. Yeah, you can take any car, even a four cylinder car like the Miata and make it sound deep and throaty and just get great sounds out of it. Um, by having a big enough resonator. So the bigger, the better. Yeah, and also don't use chambered mufflers, um, don't use chambered performance mufflers on a small engine. Um, try to go with glass packed mufflers like a, like a Magna Flow or a Borla makes a great muffler. Um, if you're looking for a good resonator, Jones Exhaust makes a louvered resonator. Um, you have these one? things, yes, they're on both my race cars, and so he really likes this. They like really that. kill the rasp. So insert clip of sound bite of of exhaust right here, right. Okay. Now didn't that sound so awesome? That was a good sound clip, huh? Yes, it sounded <laughs> excellent. I heard it. <laughs> Alright, so number 10, don't bite off more than you can chew. How All many right. times have you seen this? <laughs> yeah, this is a big one. Uh, my friends have done this. Um, Sorry guys, we're going to call you out on this. I mean, I think <laughs> I've even done it um, with the Supra, which oh. I never finished. Yeah. But Alright, so biting off by biting off more than you can chew, I mean, don't buy a project car and strip it down to the frame and and create a thousand hours worth of labor that you're mm -hmm. never going to finish. Mm -hmm. Try to do things in small bites. If you get a car that needs uh, you know, an engine and suspension work, don't just yank the engine out, yank the transmission out, yank the suspension off, and then pull the interior out and just leave it sitting there. Yeah. I mean, what's going to happen is it's going to be very intimidating. What you want to do is just work on the thing you're working on. If mm -hmm. you need to work on the motor, that's a big job. Yeah. If you got to pull the motor and bring it to a machine shop and tear it down, just do that. Wait till that's done. Get it back in. Drive the car and enjoy it a little bit. Yep, yep. And then do the next project. Make sure that's all good before yeah. you tear anything else apart. So yeah. that has got to be one of the biggest mistakes I see people making. Cars stripped to the shell and they never finish them. And There's, they never have fun. We've got a couple of them sitting out in the back lot at the shop right now. Um, not, not calling out anybody's name. <laughs> not, Sorry. Not gonna mention any names. I'm gonna just sip my tea over here right now. You're spilling some tea right now. This is not good. <laughs> should, we, should we throw in uh, an 11th? Uh, okay. I, I know this you is want. like a 10. So bonus! <laughs> so the title's gonna say 10, but this is gonna be our bonus one. Stretch tires, always bad. Yep. Uh, People love stretching tires for the look, for the fitment, all that stuff. And uh, it's, you know, often frowned upon as being a performance robbing thing. Mm -hmm. But, but there is a little bit of stretch that's okay. <laughs> I see what you did there. If you do a slight stretch on your tire, you can actually increase the sidewall stiffness mm -hmm. and improve the handling feel. Um, this is something that you can kind of fine tune with your tire sizing versus your rims. Okay. What Where you want to do... <laughs> What you want to do is think about it as the more meaty of a fitment you have on your tire, meaning... Here, let's break out the whiteboard. Break out the whiteboard again. Come on, guys. I got an eraser right there. I'm here. <laughs> All right. Breaking out the whiteboard. All right. Here's a good way to look at it. All right. Here's your wheel from the front view. 
I didn't and, know wheels were square. <laughs> and here's your tire fitment. All right, so say you have a meaty tire fitment. Your, your sidewall is going to come out a little bit like this. Okay. And what this sidewall does is it'll actually flex when you're hitting bumps, and that's where you're going to get your most comfortable ride. You're going to have a, a soft sidewall, and that's what you're going to want to have when you just want luxury and comfort, and basically, yeah. you know, that's how the manufacturers do it for most daily driven cars. A smooth ride. Now, let's talk about stretch tire. What's going to happen? So if you have your stretch tire, you're going to have... Oh, I see what's happening here. Yeah, you're going to have the walls are going to kind of triangulate a little bit in. Wait. And oh. since you don't have that curve for that it to cushion. kind of fold up as much, yeah. this is just going to stiffen this up just a little bit, and it's going to be a little bit more responsive. Hmm. Now, you don't want to go crazy with a crazy stretch because, you know, that could actually cause your car to be dangerous. It could cause your wheel to pop off, and it's not really going to increase your uh, stiffness of your sidewall anymore after a certain point, and it, it will actually decrease your surface area of your tire on the road because you're going with a narrower tire. But All right. just two things to consider. I mean, you could fine-tune it to your liking, but just have this knowledge before you decide on your fitment. So stretch is good in moderation. Yeah. All right. It's not all bad. It's not all bad. And you actually have a really good tip on how to kind of stretch tires that are a little bit too small, right? You oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. So maybe we can... I did have some there. trouble uh, stretching certain brand cheap tires um, as drift burners. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason why I was stretching these tires is because for certain competitions, there is a size limitation. We can't run larger than a 245 yeah. tire so you on our drift cars. Um, so I stretched them on a 10 and a half inch rim and certain tires didn't really want to stretch too much. <laughs> so uh, we actually cut some boards and yeah. we pre-stretched the tires. It took us a little while to figure out how to do this Turned the good. best way. But it uh, we tried modifying the the uh, cheetah yeah. to try to get more we air. Clips. We should insert some of those clips now. Yep, we used uh, ether to blow yeah. the tires on, and that works pretty well. But Sometimes. certain <laughs> brands are really stubborn. They just the cheaper tires, they just kind of curve in, and mm. they don't want to meet the sidewall. So what we found that we did was we wedged. I cut a bunch of two by fours that were uh, a little bit wider than the actual rim, and just shoved them in between the sidewalls of the tire all the way around, and pre-stretched the tires. You do it like you know, a week or a few days before mm -hmm. your drift event, and, it was and uh, they pop right on pop if you right pre-stretch them. Yeah. So that was the solution to that. That's kind of a nice little life hack for you there if you're a drifter or you you like to stretch tires, but it, having a hard time. Yeah. All right. So what do you think? Pretty good episode? I think so. Leave your comment Help down below people. if you think that, um, you know, you like some of these tips. Um, Leave a comment down below if you're guilty of any of these misconceptions and... Nobody's going to admit to that. Oh. Um, so leave a comment down below if you're not guilty of any of these things. <laughs> Hit that like button if you want to see more videos like this. And, uh, yeah, and subscribe. Yeah, especially <laughs> like this. We don't usually do these type no. of videos where we're, you know, sitting at a table we're and talking, just discussing. But... We're usually at the track or in the shop. But, yeah, definitely let us know uh, if you found this information and you'd like to see more videos like yeah. this, technical videos. And hit that like button if you like cats or if you don't like cats. Just, yeah. All right, Snickies. All right, that's a wrap. You want to say bye? Oh, no! Hey, no! <laughs> Snicky, you got to say that's a wrap. Ready? Ready? Be like, that's a wrap! <laughs>